my name is Eileen Cullen. I'm with the UW Extension and UW Madison Entomology Department, uh, the Field Crops and Forage Crops Extension Entomologist. And I'm here today with my colleague. Bill Stangle with Soil Solutions Consulting. I'm an independent consultant working uh, southern Wisconsin. And today we're standing in a no-till cornfield and we're going to talk a little bit about slugs today. Um, you know, no-till has great advantages. It's a system that allows farmers um, to reduce soil erosion. It can save labor um, in terms of operations in the field, increase soil moisture and tilth. And it's always important when we have different cropping systems to align our knowledge of insects, or in this case slugs, which are not an insect, uh, as you'll see in a little bit, but um, how that management system may create a habitat that favors some pests or insects over others. And no-till is one with slugs that they do like a cool, moist environment and some of that no-till residue, which provides all those other benefits in the cropping system and the soil management, it can create a, a habitat for slugs. So Bill, do you want to tell us a little bit about this field and how slugs might have found this to be a good habitat? Sure. Okay. Uh, over the years, uh, in our no-till systems throughout the Midwest, uh, a recurring pest problem that we've had has been slugs. And it boils down to residue management and how do we deal with uh, plant positioning and uh, uh, moving residue and addressing the habitat issues that this pest just uh, needs to thrive. One of the things that we're always dealing with, uh, our, our common denominator in a bad slug year is we go through periods of cool wet conditions, uh, generally some delayed planting, and uh, slow poor growing conditions for corn. Our number one tool in dealing with this slug issue is residue management. And we handle that in a couple different ways. One is with a, a trash whipper residue mover right on the corn planter to clear the planting zone of, of uh, any previous crop residue. A uh, second method is to do a separate strip till operation and plant right back into that uh, residue free zone. The differences in uh, uh, slug feeding where we have a healthy slug population can be dramatic. Uh, there's a dramatic difference in, that, in the level of feeding just by simply moving the residue. Uh, by far, this is our most effective tool for dealing with this pest year in and year out. We're standing in an area that demonstrates uh, uh, the effectiveness of moving residue. Uh, the corn right here, uh, you can see we've got a residue-free zone right along the plant. These are the strips that were created last fall. Uh, we're near the edge of the field and the first pass with the planter was off of the, the residue-free zone. You can see residue-free here and this short area, the uh, uh, corn was planted directly into the uh, corn residue. The residue movers on the planter itself weren't quite set aggressively enough to move this much residue and uh, you can see the result in the feeding. Uh, there are even some, some plants that were uh, uh, eaten off as they were emerging. Here's one that was delayed emergence. We had an open slot in this case and if we have an open slot we're very vulnerable to slug damage. Uh, in a high residue environment. But uh, you, this is an example of doing a good job of residue management dramatically improves your odds on dealing with this pest. So we're in the area of the field that Bill Stengel mentioned where the corn has been planted, um, in this case right in the corn residue row, a good habitat for slugs. And as we've been looking today for slugs, obviously we've seen the damage, the uh, rasping, kind of scraping um, feeding symptom on the leaves. We go to the residue, right where that corn has been planted. And as we move the residue back, it takes a couple minutes to get your search image, but you can see here some slugs. There's one here. A lot of times you can see them first by the slime. And then you can see another one on the move right here. 
And this one's a little darker and a little bigger. These are all the, the gray garden slug. It's common in this area that we're seeing in this field here. So you can see we pulled these right out of the residue area as you'd expect. Gray garden slug. Um, just a few things to know, a couple of things about the life cycle of the slug. Again, it's not an insect. It's um, a, a mollusk and it's related to the to snails. Um, they overwinter primarily in the egg stage, although there can be some um, uh, adults that overwinter as well. The slugs actually have both uh, female and male parts. They're a hermaphrodite, but most of the mating does take place with another slug. But the important thing to know in terms of another cultural control of planting date for corn and soybean um, is that they overwinter primarily in the egg stage. And observations that we've seen, um, and also in, in some of the literature, is that in addition to probably the number one control or you know management method is that uh, residue management that Bill Stangl spoke about and demonstrated so well in this field. Another one is planting date. It's not. Qu it's a little bit more limited, um, but if anything, planting a little bit more on the early side uh, can allow the crop to be planted when most of the slugs are still in the egg stage, before they've hatched out into this juvenile stage. And what we've seen is that that can have some uh, effect to obviously let the corn and the soybean grow and get a head start. At this point in the day, you have to actually locate slug feeding damage by the damage on the plants. And then as you saw looking through the residue, the time that you can really see the slugs feeding on the plant is actually, since they do feed in a more nocturnal phase, is at dusk before it gets dark. Uh, sometimes even as, after it gets dark with a flashlight or very early morning. Or sometimes during the day on very cloudy days, very overcast and cloudy days. All right. In this field we've got uh, some slug feeding on soybeans and a similar pattern to what we had in the corn. Uh, we're in a spot where the uh, beans were planted directly over the old corn row. The residue wasn't moved. You can also see we've got a little wheat residue here from uh, which would have been two years ago. Uh, and the feeding on the soybeans is showing up. Uh, they'll basically chew the green tissue off. You can see their slime trail. They're leaving the uh, veins and eating everything in between the veins. On the cotyledons, you can see uh, this chewing on the cotyledon itself. It looks much different from seed corn maggot, but uh, you'll see them at quite often at the same time of year. The other thing that you'll see is some of the scarring on the stem. In this case it's not too pronounced, but as the season progresses, if it would stay wet, you'll see this continual scarring. They'll feed on the stem and then and move up the, the plant itself and uh, continue feeding into the uh, growing season. Uh, over here we've got a few uh, you've seen enough slugs already. Mm. Right here we've got slugs showing up right in the seed trench. Uh, in this case the beans are very, very shallow and uh, uh, they'll reside, if they reside in the trench, you're at, they, you run the risk of them uh, eating the beans off as they're uh, emerging and just working on the cotyledon and the hypocotyl itself. And, doing damage that way. Here we've got what's left of a cotyledon that had been growing and uh, the stem is completely gone. So another management method that is available is um, uh, use of baits for slugs. It's important to remember that slugs are not an insect so insecticides are actually not registered um, for slugs. Um, the biology of the slug and um, the bait activity, the primary, the active ingredient is metaldehyde and there are various baits that are uh, trade names that are, are formed around this um, active ingredient that's um, put into a food-based bait that attracts slugs to that uh, granule bait that has the metaldehyde active ingredient. And what those baits do, they obviously draw the slugs to them to feed on that active ingredient. Um, slugs, their biology, they have mucus producing cells that produce the slime, 
which does two things for the slug. The slime aids in their movement. That's how uh, you, they move in the field and you can see the traces of their, their slime when you're scouting for them. Um, and also the, the slime or the mucus helps them to shed toxins from their body. So that's another reason that insecticides um, uh, tend not to work because they'll be able to slough that off. So what the metaldehyde does is it disrupts the mucus producing cells in the slug. They're not able to produce that slime and then that leads to their, to their mortality. So with uh, the baits, um, some of the important things to remember are the, really the rate of application, the distribution or density in, in the field, and the cost. They are, tend to be quite expensive. So the recommended rate is 10 pounds per acre. Um, the distribution in the field is actually four to five of the granules per square foot. And that's fairly easy because the baits are a blue color, so they have a bright color that you can see um, and measure your distribution throughout the field. And again, that costs are at least $15 to $20 per acre. So they are a higher cost um, management. Um, a couple things to keep in mind about slugs and in this context of applying baits, metaldehyde bait for, for slugs, is that um, we really don't have, there aren't economic thresholds for slugs. We don't recommend scouting or counting the number of eggs in the soil or juveniles or adults. Um, but rather, um, before, if you do apply a bait treatment, before application, you can use some of these scouting methods. Um, if you're scouting at dusk, you can count the slugs on the plant just to give yourself an idea of density before the bait treatment. And then certainly after, you can see if you have a reduction in numbers. And really, of course, the regrowth of the plant is your key indication of, of efficacy. So that their primary activity is late spring, early summer. And they'll have an activity when the slugs are larger out again in the fall. And usually in a given year, if, if things are going well and you have a good, hot, dry conditions, they can have a dip in their activity and that crop is growing through their feeding activity. There can be cases where you have cloudy days and their activity can continue through the season. So to recap the important things about managing slug, slug activity, it's really important to understand their habitat. We've explained that today in the, in the no-till field. Um, certainly it's good to know that, um, you know, residue removal and tillage will really help to, to reduce slug problems. So in a no-till system where that option is limited, we look at the three main options. Number one is really that cultural control. The first line of management for slugs is at planting. Um, and anything pre-planting like zone tillage or trash whippers or row cleaners, as you've seen today, that can really remove that residue from the planting row. So other tillage methods that might move residue around in the field, but in a more even way, um, so that you'd still be planting into residue, wouldn't help as much as these methods that you've, we've talked about today, clearing that, that planting row, um, doing some zone tillage. That will be the number one method that, that can help. Um, you're giving that corn plant a chance to, and the soy, or the soybean plant to germinate and grow and get a head start on the slug activity. So that's number one. Um, Number two would be uh, to a more limited degree, but if you have had slug problems in the past and you have a no-till situation, after you've managed that cultural control, looking a bit at planting date, a little bit on the earlier side, that's where you can adjust planting date to try to plant in that relatively residue-free corn or soybean row. Uh, planting early is when the slugs will primarily be in the egg stage. So you want to try, you know, weather per, uh, conditions permitting and, and other factors on the farm. That's another little bit of a tinkering that you can do with planting date. A little bit later planting, you're likely to be planting into the slug, um, you know, after they've hatched. And then the third method is the bait, um, metaldehyde baits that we've described today, which are quite expensive and uh, somewhat limited in their uh, application because of the expense. But that is a third piece of the, the integrated um, approach.